part two of our Palantir valuation. If you haven't seen the first video yet, uh, go back and check it out. We've done some research on the company uh, and created a financial model with a base case of assumptions. Uh, in this video, we're going to be looking at the bullish case and the bearish case and compare the three and see which story or, or valuation we think is most likely to play out. Firstly, just, just tying up some loose ends in the valuation process, I just wanted to uh, show you this here. And these are what I call the twin engines of growth for Palantir. I feel, I feel these are Palantir's most important KPIs outside of the income and, and cash flow statement. Now, <clears throat> they seem pretty basic. Average customer spend, number of customers seems fairly obvious, but behind all those complex products and services, there are fairly um, straightforward financials and KPIs that are going to drive the company's success. Now, we've got average customer spend here at 5 million currently, number of customers at 150. Average customer spend is growing at 37% per year at the moment. Now, we're doing a forecast here where we say it's going to grow at 20% over time, over the 10-year period, which is, as you can see, we've broken down here. Uh, that gets us to about 30 million average customer spend by 2030. Um, number of customers, 150 currently. We're going to say it's going to grow at 15% a year. That gets us to 600 by 2030. Now, I don't know the growth rate of average customers at the moment. They haven't actually provided that. But 15% seems likely considering they've just burst onto the um, commercial scene. You know, and it's still fairly, it's still fairly young, uh, the commercial segment of the business. So they wouldn't have to add too many customers each year to get to that 600. Now, addressable market down here, currently 120 billion. Uh, we're going to say that's going to move at 3%, the rate of the world economy, which is sort of their market anyway. So we get to 160 billion by 2030. Just some notes on the above. I just want to run through quickly, just tying up some loose ends, as I say. So ideally, Palantir are going to want this to grow quicker than the number of customers, uh, just due to their, their customer lifecycle economics. Uh, so if we look at the presentation they provided um, on their investor day, you can see you know, they can get from a loss leading sale to a very profitable sale, high margin sale in quite quick succession. So even the expand phase here isn't, isn't too bad. So you can see they generally lose money in the acquiring phase, turn a decent profit in the expand phase, and they start to earn very high margins in the scale phase. I can also see their most profitable customers being government, just due to the amount of spending power that they have uh, without having to consider whether it's a profitable investment for them like a commercial customer would have to. They obviously do have budgets and things like that, albeit very big budgets for spending, defence-related spending and security, but they don't have to look at it like a business would and say, what return on investment will we get from it here? So I see them being the most profitable customers for Palantir. And um, with the 30 mil average spend in year 10, we're assuming that they reach just over their potential spend per customer for their total addressable market. So 160 billion divided by 6,000 customers, that's an average spend of 27 million. We're reaching just over that average due to um, the top 25% representing mostly government, which tend to be larger spenders. Now, number of customers, uh, 600 versus their current 6,000 total addressable market. With it being only 10% capture of the market, it seems very reasonable. Uh, the commercial segment of the business is still very much in its infancy, and they're now focused on deploying the products rather than creating new ones. So this number here, sorry, this number here will likely grow without too much effort. Um, we saw examples of the commercial customers in the previous video. And as you could see, they appeal to a variety of different businesses for different purposes. As well, so we had J.P. Morgan as a bank. We had uh, automobile company and Fiat Chrysler. We had oil company and BP, and an aviation company and Airbus. So the effect of these twin engines is similar to the upwards effect that a stock experiences when uh, both earnings per share grow and the P/E multiple does, due to investors buying more. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of an analogy of uh, of how this works above. Now, as you can see, that gets us to an estimated revenue of about eighteen point six billion in 2030, just based off of these two metrics getting to this point. Now that's a little bit above our base case that we had here uh, in 2030 for 16 and a half billion of revenue, but it's good that they're they're around about the same number or, or near to each other. As you can see, we, we're not forecasting really, really expansive growth in either of these. We're just saying that 
both of them are going to grow at a decent rate over time. And, you know, the coupled effect of that is going to show significant results. But it's good to it's good to always compare this sort of bottoms up approach of, of valuation with your financial model. Just to give you an idea of how accurate it is. Right. So let's now get into the bull case and bear case valuation. Uh, then we'll have a look at summarizing the three and see which story we think is more likely. OK, let's start with the bull case. So as you can see, I've already filled out the financial forecast. So we'll have a look at the assumptions first. Let's let's have a look here. So we're now saying that revenue is going to grow at 45 percent, which is currently at 50 or 45. So we're saying that's that's going to carry on for the next one to three years. 45 percent is the average. Then going to tone down to 35, then to 25 uh, later in the period that gets us a compound annual growth rate of 35% over the 10 year period. Now 35%, the base case was 30%, I believe. Yeah, 30%. So the ball case we're going with 35 over the period. That gets us to 21 billion in revenue by 2030, 7.4 billion of EBIT. Uh, we're also applying a slightly higher EV to EBITDA multiple, so we're getting a higher terminal value multiple. We're going with not quite the software uh, industry average of 35 or 36, but we've taken an average of the software market and some relative companies as well, Microsoft, Google, and Adobe. I've taken out Salesforce because it's too high. And we get an average of about 31. All right, so we're working with 31 as our EV to EBIT multiple. Now, that gets us to a terminal value of 236 billion in year 10. Uh, and when we look at that in a DCF, 240 billion market cap, um, share price of $139 uh, in 2030. Intrinsic value, 55 billion, offer a required rate of 15%. Uh, that gives us a buy price of basically $24 per share, uh, which we're not too far off of now. Uh, in an IRR, as you can see down here, the IRR shifted up to about 20% we could expect from buying the stock price at $28 now. 20%, not bad return. Can you see this playing out? I mean, it's not it's not unachievable. It doesn't seem uh, it doesn't seem too far of a stretch, although we are oh, we're also carrying the assumption, sorry, that they're gonna reach that 35% operating margin target by year five. Now, remember, apart from the one-off expenses um, from the direct listing and some other expenses actually as well, their operating margin has actually turned positive. Uh, already in this period so could you see it getting to 35 or their target in five years six years time maybe now we can make a couple of changes to this uh, if we don't think it's quite bullish enough so we look at the EV to EBIT DAR uh, sorry EV to EBIT multiple uh, and if we just go ahead and say we don't think the software industry uh, multiple is going to change much in the next five ten years if anything it might go up because the industry is getting more important uh, then we can apply an EV to EBIT multiple of the industry average or market segment average. And that gives us a terminal value of 20 or 260 billion in year 10, which as you can see, gives us a higher buyer price. IRR goes up to 22% uh, if you were buying Palantir today. So as you can see, we could play around with this in, in many different ways and, and we'll get we'll get slightly different values or get an idea of if whatever story plays out, what sort of return we can expect from it. But I'm going to go with the uh, slightly less bullish uh, terminal value multiple there of 31. Now, let's look at the bear case. As you can see, it's a little bit less astounding on the face of it. Let's have a look at the assumptions over here. So we're keeping the growth, the revenue growth, uh, especially the short term one, because I think that's not going to change much. It'd be unrealistic to change that unless something bad happens in the near term we're going to say though that growth starts to slow in year eight down to 20 percent we get a compound annual growth rate of 25 percent over the period ebit margin here we've changed the ebit margin so the main thing here is we're saying we're, they're never going to reach that target operating margin of 35 percent at all uh this bear case is saying it's going to stay at or it's going to get to 25 percent as the maximum in year 10 only giving us an ebit of only three billion in 2030 uh, terminal value based off of that would be about 90 billion um, so you can see I, I've, I've put something here which is the similar companies uh, with similar market cap so AMD and Square not as comparable but let's say Uber you know you'd be looking at an Uber type company um, 
priced like an Uber in year 10 if we went with that uh, terminal value. Now you can see in the DCF here, uh, it looks it looks a lot worse when we when we forecast like this. So we have an intrinsic value of 20 billion um, as of today. Obviously about half, that's more than half of the um, current market cap. Buy price of $9 per share, uh, which actually it was at for, for a small amount of time after it um, listed. IRR 8%, so saying that, you know, if we bought today with that forecast, we could get a very, very average return. So the risk really here as investors is in the price uh, and uh, what sort of forecast or what sort of story plays out for them. Okay, so in summary, if we if we look at the three cases um, and we think about what's more likely to happen, it's really boiling down to what sort of story can you see unfolding for Palantir in the future. And if we use sort of a relative method or comparable method, and, and let's have a think about what we see playing out. So in the bullish case, can you see them um, reaching the heights of like an Adobe or PayPal in 2030? If so, uh, then the bullish case, you know, uh, might be more believable to you or, or might seem more reasonable, uh, more than believable, sorry. Base case, like a Salesforce or Netflix type valuation um, or market cap, you know, can you see that sort of story playing out? Obviously, these four here are fairly close to each other anyway. They're all very, very good companies and there's not much between the market caps, to be honest. Bearish case, do you see them being like an Uber? <laughs> now, uh, I hope they'll. I hope they perform a lot better than than Uber have for their shareholders uh, in recent years. To be honest with you, but Uber, you know, valued at about ninety billion, uh, ninety to hundred billion. Obviously, uh, a very disruptive company uh, in what they were doing, but they couldn't quite make it work in the financials. So, do you see it playing out as an Uber, or do you see it more like these companies up here, or maybe even higher? And look, if it's if it's more like a Facebook or or someone like that, that sort of, or Alibaba, or that sort of disruptor, then, you know, by all means, you should probably buy the stock uh, and hold it. But you know, that's, I'm not telling you to do that. That's not advice. That's just my opinion. Okay, so there we have it. The bull, bear, and base case, um, and then a little bit of a bottoms-up valuation for Palantir as well. That just about does it. So let me know in the comments what sort of case you see playing out for Palantir, um, and also what other companies you want, um, you know, you want me to look at. I'm going to be looking at a few other companies that are fairly similar to Palantir, but I'm also going to look at um, some some more mature companies as well that we can try and value that uh, take take a few less assumptions. But thank you for watching again. If you found it useful, um, please leave a like, subscribe so you can get a notification on the next video, and good luck with your investments.